access some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It is so nice to see you tonight. Or hear me. You, you hear me. Oh, yeah. Hey, Chris. Hi, Gulp. We're going to talk about Game of Thrones and what does power mean and uh, talk a little bit about political power and where it's derived from and uh, a whole lot of nerd talk about Game of Thrones. So, not going to lie, it's not relevant to you if you don't know the show, haven't caught up on the show. It's not, Spoilers ahead. Not for you. So, be, be aware. So, we'll be back right after this. Warning. This show is for adults. Produced by semi-adults. So, the language is sometimes strong and offensive. <laughs> Said, uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. All right, welcome back. This is Chris Spangle with the music incredibly loud. Uh, ironically, the one person in the room without headphones is my coworker on radio. What's up? Uh, Jess Alsman, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? It's so nice to see your face. Uh, saw you yesterday. I was like, I can't have a Game of Thrones episode without the resident nerd at the at the day job. I would have been bitter. You would have been mad at me. Yeah. And I share an office with you, so I'm not taking any chances. Yeah. Uh, also here is one of the OGs from episode one through 39-ish. <laughs> Galt. Chris Galt. I'm here. Chris Galt is here. Uh, he is uh, feisty as ever. He's going to uh, piss you off. He's where he, he and I are probably going to a Android, iPhone uh, argue. You know, maybe some of that oh, later yeah. in the show. Let's but do it. Wait, am I going to have to fight him? Uh, yes, please. Uh, that, <laughs> that is Todd Singer. That would Singer. make it more interesting and blow the show up. <laughs> Todd Singer. Uh, Todd, I don't know. Have you, have you ever been on the show? I have not. Okay. Although I have done a podcast in this apartment before. You have, yeah. I'm sorry, in the studio before. Do you still do that podcast? No, it's it's defunct. It's on it's on hiatus. Okay. Well, that means it's never coming back. It's, it's never coming yeah, back. Just, just, I have one of those. Yeah, never not. N what <laughs> Nearly is total nonsense. Nearly total With nonsense. Christopher Peffers. Yeah, who's in God knows where. We did a couple episodes. It was pretty good. You got a defunct podcast too, Jess? Well, we tried. Yep. That's I mean, we tried. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, everybody's got a defunct podcast. Mine's the Chris Spangle Show. And some would say we are libertarians, <laughs> to be quite honest with you, <laughs> um, depending on who you talk to. Uh, Todd Singer is the man who hired me at the Libertarian Party of Indiana right. and completely changed the trajectory of my life. It was the the wisest decision you've ever made, isn't it? It was. It was made at more the, so uh, than your wife. Go ahead, say Cracker Barrel in Plainfield. <laughs> it's, it's the best hire I've uh, I've ever made personally. Uh, yeah, that's very kind. Um, <laughs> I do have a gun to his head. I made him say that. Uh, no, Todd was my boss for six months, nine months. Something like that. Yeah, my, my second kid came around and I uh, decided, you know, hey, it's it's uh, time to let somebody else. When when Sam said, hey, uh, I would, I think I could do that. Like, hey, that sounds great to me. Sam's good people. Sam Goldstein, <laughs> currently on the LNC. He was my boss for the rest of my time at the Libertarian Party of Indiana. Great guy. Um, y you wouldn't say that. If you, like, if you know Sam, great guy. If you don't know Sam, total <laughs> asshole. Right? That's so true. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> and so last year, or 2016, actually, it's, my God, it's 2019, when uh, Sam was in all this brouhaha of, oh, they wouldn't let Ron Paul speak at the convention. Sam Goldstein wouldn't let him. Like, Sam hates a lot of people, but he's a very fair man. Uh, you're just making things up, Joshua Smith, and we know that he makes things up. So. Yeah. Um, so Todd, very, very good friend of mine, a uh, long time, uh, listener and supporter of the show, Patreon supporter, uh, and we're very happy to have you here. So thank you for a being a Patreon supporter. Welcome. And, uh, B, do I owe you a poster? <laughs> uh, I don't know. All right. Well, there's probably <laughs> a few of you that I do. I apologize. I hired someone to do the posters and then they lost them. So They're, we're reordering those. My, my wife doesn't let me hang up posters. It's, <laughs> it's quite all right. That's right? a big fail. It is. Did yes. you demote her? Uh, yes. Spanker? I fired her. Oh. She now works in New York City. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> She's a Democrat. That's Fail a, up. That's a oh, downgrade. Wow. No, no. She, it was not her so fault. So she left you. It was a breakup. It was. No, it wasn't a breakup. We <laughs> never had romantic relations. A uh, podcast breakup. <laughs> yeah, speaking of that, show. last time Alsman was here, I lost two co-hosts. Uh, <laughs> I witnessed the beginning of the end, right. and I didn't realize it. I'm sorry. Uh, what would a- I have done, though? Said, hey. You guys, this isn't a good idea. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> or it's a great idea. I don't know. It's a great idea. They're, I'm not involved. They're still happily to together. We're great. happy for them. Yeah. Great idea. They made a great choice to pursue other things. <laughs> ah, let's change the subject. Just, Game of Thrones. Just as a, we both work for the Bob and Tom <laughs> show, which we, we normally don't talk about Game of Thrones uh, or we don't talk about my day job, uh, but it's a comedy radio show. She's the resident geek on the show. She does a series. You should go f- subscribe to the YouTube channel, Bob and Tom Show. You can see every Friday. Uh, she is in the Week in Review. I produce it along with our friend Grace Singer. And she does a series called Overthinking with Jess Alsman. We've only done two. Uh, <laughs> we've been meaning to do more, but she overthinks it. I'm too busy overthinking them. Right. I've got a lot to do, though. A lot of them are just lined up, ready to roll out. So get ready, Spangle. What are you, what are you, what's on the top three, would you say? Ooh, overthinking your Indy 500 fashion. Okay. Ooh. That only works for this week, though, uh, with the race. We'll never get it. Up. We'll never Sorry. get it done in time. Okay, overthinking your menstrual cycle for men, not to ever say. You know, guys are like, "What are you on your period?" It's the worst thing you can say to a girl. So it's basically overthinking that altogether and explaining what you should do instead, like the signs to look for. I apologize uh, for saying that to you last week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. possible that it was I the inspiration for that particular one. A lot of guys in that building are. <laughs> it, it's possible I might well, know someone who who puts his uh, wife's cycle on his personal calendar just as a reminder. <laughs> just hide. You know what though? It's okay is, is that as why long you're here? as they don't say no, it. No, it's not. <laughs> you just can't say it like, oh, it's a full moon. I know what that is. This is the twenty-eight days. It's or no. twenty-nine days. Or... Yeah. So, and we're here to educate men. Yes. I, I will say it jokingly, but it, you really, it's demeaning. It's that's why like guys will say like oh you're just hormonal because you're not a girl like it's like why is it annoying to women because it's just an excuse for them to say no matter what you say right now you're not being rational so I don't have to listen right like I don't care if I don't know how to load the dishwasher you're just irrational right now right because your uterus is shedding its lining it's them copping out right right it's a, yeah. sort sort of like calling someone a crazy bee. It's like, oh, you're just crazy. It's like sort of the same. It hits the same note. Would you right. Say? Right. And you, and you did on. that. Yeah. I I I I've, I've, I've <laughs> this week. I was joking with her. <laughs> uh, because was had, it funny? Did she laugh? I don't know. Did you? I think I was like, no, it's PMDD. You want to <laughs> so. talk about it? And that's a whole other thing besides PMS. <laughs> Yeah, I've had like six jobs, and they all make you take sexual harassment training. Oh, we had to <laughs> and take it's it. Literally, yeah. Wait a minute, are you sure? In there says. <laughs> if it's six different places, I'm having you do sexual harassment <laughs> training. I don't know if you can make that connection for sure. No, <laughs> Jess and I share an office, and most of the day is her just yelling in my direction. Not at me, just... Yelling. I mean, just, or talking, and then I'm like, "Are you listening?" Because I'll have his <laughs> headphones on. My, my job is audio and video editing, and if I don't have my headphones on, then I'm never going to get anything done. So you're never really listening. You're always just nodding your head. And yes, it's, and it's not. <laughs> you're <Jess's>, right. <laughs> and, yes. Yep. And Jess is the the least of the problems. I mean, you vouch for me. My office is Grand Central Station where we work. It is. People seem to just migrate there naturally. Right. Because you and I are there. We're the fun people that work there. Everybody else is boring. <laughs> and that's not true. Uh, we're the only ones here, so we can say it's true. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's not true. Uh, and so everybody kind of ends up in, the, in my office. And literally, like, from the time I get in there between 9 or 10 until the time I leave, it's just one person after another. And I just looked at my boss today and I go, I got some thinking that I got to do. I might not come in this week. And he goes, I totally get it. Because <laughs> you have a hideaway office somewhere else. He has a hideaway office somewhere else. It's like, I don't know. It's a very social workplace, like where any radio station is. And, you know, it's just sort of a certain point. I, I got to get I got to get stuff done. I'm very efficient. Am I not? You are. It's so you amazing. need a hideaway office. I do. Yeah. So. Well, this is kind of my hideaway office. Yeah. But so they let you come home and work from home? Yeah. Oh, we, nice. have, we, have, we have like the best bosses in the world. And I'm not just saying that because we're on tape. I mean, would you agree with me? Yeah. If you're getting your job done, that's all that matters. Yeah. And you can do it anywhere, kind of. Yeah. Most of the time. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of my production I have to do at work, but the emails I can answer from the sunny back porch. Nice. So yeah, or so on the it's, beach in Florida. Yeah, it's very nice. Um, but yeah, I, I have a lot of p- 
projects going and I got a lot that I got to get done in the day. And so I apologize if I ever ignored you, Jess. No, it makes me mad when you're extremely efficient, knocking things off your to-do list. I'm like, that's not fair. I'm not knocking things off. Pay attention to me. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't mean to be focused. No, it's okay. I'm the only focused person that has ever worked in the radio industry. It's really annoying to everybody, I think. It's beneficial. If you ignore me, I eventually just go away. I'm like a cat. Right. <laughs> she does. And then I feel bad because I realized why she's leaving. I ignored her. And then I'm like, oh, Jess, come back. I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, no, no. I got the hint. And you're right. You were absolutely right. I'm going to go do my job now. I try not to ignore you. Sometimes I'm just, I get, like, I get into the zone and then I just can't. I can't get out of it. That's okay. Yeah. I turn to you for politics, though. That's right. So I can be a little dangerous talking that's right. with the friends and family. That's right. That's the that's what we do here. Uh, Galt. Dangerous speak. That's my middle name. Yeah, Galt. Uh, <laughs> here's the funny thing about this show. What's uh, that? The, the progenitor of Galt leaving was the fact that we would not let him talk about fluoride in the water and conspiracy theories in 2012. So this program started March 8th, 2012. That was when the first episode dropped. The first one was recorded late February because I f didn't record. I didn't hit record. Yeah. It got <laughs> we had to up. do the first episode twice. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But if you go back and you listen to it, it's, it's I think, us talking about maybe Ron Paul versus mm -hmm. Gary Johnson or mm -hmm. something. I don't know. It's But it's it started in early 2012 during the 2012 election. So we're about to do our third election cycle, which is crazy. And, you know, back in 2012, Todd, you didn't talk about conspiracy theories, especially if you were a libertarian. Well, not around here. I didn't uh, talk much about that. I was, you know, being in Indiana, I was trying to be, you know, straight laced and talk about all of the fiscal aspects of things. And even if it was like marijuana, like, OK, well, let's frame that as a fiscal issue. How much money that we're spending on incarcerating and investigating and, and such and such. Yeah, you hired me in 2008, October 2008, and it was almost it was almost a no pot discussion rule. I mean, we didn't talk about marijuana because a lot of that that time period for libertarians was we don't want to be seen as crazy. We've we've gone through 35, 40 years of the guy in the Hawaiian shirt trying to be outrageous on the televised debate, talking about marijuana. And it was such a punchline of, you know, pot and libertarians. But lo and behold, you look 10 years later, and, and it's damn near legalized everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and now, he didn't talk about conspiracies because it was, it was completely taboo. You would immediately get, to, you know, run out of the rails as a crazy person. And we now have a conspiracy theorist as a president. Mm -hmm. And the media is a conspiracy theorist about a, the, the president. And you've apologized to that. Uh, I, I actually that. have, yeah, because while I don't believe in conspiracy theories, I, I do believe that some older conspiracy theories like the like JFK and some of that stuff, I think that the Dulles brothers were the two most evil men to live, and so was LBJ. Um, but like 9-11 truth, fluoride in the water, I'm sorry I'm not down with all that stuff, but... I, I think there actually is fluoride in the water. Oh, you is, you no, don't understand the <laughs> benefits of spring water? No, I understand Fresh spring water. I understand having good teeth. Right. Fresh right. spring water does not have fluoride in it. Let's not beat this dead <laughs> horse. Creighton is not here to punch you. Which which was my point. You have apologized for it. But But I've still yet to hear from Creighton. Creighton, you'll never get an apology. <laughs> First of all, Creighton has a big boy job in New York City with a very reputable firm. And still doesn't talk about it. And still, still, <laughs> he will never be back on the show because I just thought about it the other day. Oh, God, this, he won't. this show has been on so long that we now have people with great jobs in high places and 20 years from now, I'll be like, I'm destitute. Can you hire me, Creighton? <laughs> Remember me? No. <laughs> um, Can I clean your house? <laughs> right. I know how to uh, do toilets. Uh, but I think that the term conspiracy theorist which is sort of what you were trying to say is just a blanket term to pro it's a propaganda term it's like far right yep it, it, it's it's anytime you see the media talking about far right commentator and then they mention Ben Shapiro and you're like the dude couldn't be more mainstream <laughs> conservative down the road fair right. to the left you know it's like you it's a propagandist term and so you can just label anybody a conspiracy theorist and the the point of the term is that this person is not fit to be in society, therefore it doesn't matter what happens to them. And none of his other political opinions matter. Right. It yeah. doesn't matter that Alex Jones, you've never seen one second, and I'm not defending on Alex Jones on this, but I am defending 
the the charge against the media, okay? Right. Because if Alex Jones had ever said, I want you to show up at those parents' house and terrorize them, you would see that everywhere all the time. Have you ever, think about this, America, have you ever seen Alex Jones on video, which he broadcast every minute of his video free across the world, have you ever seen one second of him talking about Sandy Hook or saying go terrorize parents? No, you haven't, but you've heard... He said some stuff about Sandy Hook, and he's a conspiracy theorist, and he denies that this happened. And it and it, it's th- sort of the same has happened with Gavin McInnes. Uh, Gavin McInnes, g- he started the th- something called the Proud Boys, which was mostly a like uh, what he calls a men's club, and it basically was just like a bunch of dudes getting together, forming a like our liberty and chills, and it was based around chauvinism and Western culture. I mean, which basically just means we're gonna just be a bunch of misogynistic dudes and they started to deci- they decided to start fighting back against antifa who was shutting down conservative speakers and then all of a sudden they're a terrorist organization and he's a ter- lead- leader of a terrorist organization and you just go how many times have you ever listened to gavin mcinnis but you know he's a leader of a terrorist cell he's uh he's a uh, racist he's a uh, uh he's all these different terms that you just use to move somebody out of the fra- out, out of public opinion um, because you don't want to deal with what they say. Uh, and then Alex Jones gets banned from Facebook for having Gavin McGinnis on his on his show off of Facebook. So he, he gets banned from Facebook for something he didn't do on the platform. And then if you bitch about it on the platform, you get banned. Yeah. So, so the slippery slope, I'd like to point out, hey, remember when somebody two and a half years ago, two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, at the least, was saying, this is a dangerous precedent. You don't want them going down this road because it's only going to get worse. We're at worse, and it's only going to get worse over time. You think next year they're going to just, you know what? Free speech is good. We've changed our mind. That's exactly why I wanted us to talk about it. I wanted right. us to look past the propaganda right. and just and just look at the issues for a second and not, and not have to polarize things so much and label things. Yeah. Even the term I was just woke back then in 2012, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you, you hear the term deep state now in mainstream media pretty regularly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was something in you know, yeah. 2008 or whatever. Right. You, were, Absolutely. you said that term, you're just completely written off. Right. Totally. So we are, we're, it's funny to look back in the beginning. You'll go listen to the first five episodes and just kind of think about how much further down certain rabbit holes we are how much you know <laughs> like you you the good thing about we are libertarians it's th- you can go back and watch the sands of time you yeah. go back and listen to all the, the episodes. shows not only helped the audience it's helped you too right you've grown uh i have grown i started this show married <laughs> i'm no longer married i started this show with you and uh, you're all i've got left <laughs> <laughs> I'll, i'm still here <laughs> <laughs> we're we're gonna right pause thing. now for a few minutes. <laughs> I gotta go. Brief intermission. <laughs> All right. So let's. The the reason we are gathered here today is to talk about Game of Thrones, and um, you know we're gonna have some nerd talk around it. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to stop these three. Uh, <laughs> the the person who was here earlier goes, I just. You know, they all seem to know each other, and, like, I just don't know anybody, and I go, they've never met. They're just really <laughs> geeking out over Game of Thrones. No, I think she's like, oh, I thought you were going to talk about politics. <laughs> you're going to you're geek out over Game of Thrones? Ah, see ya. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Jess, Jess, you were like, please don't invite me if you're going to talk about politics. I just want to talk about dragons. No, when I said I was coming on here, my boyfriend was like, you're going to talk politics? I go, Lord, no. We're talking Game of Thrones. He That's goes, okay, that makes more sense. All right, so let's start with our general impressions of uh, this epi- Like, Let's just say the whole story arc and the last episode specifically. I'm not going to give you a spoiler alert because if you're stupid enough to start listening to a podcast that's ti- got Game of Thrones in the title two days after the finale, then you know what you're going to get. So you don't get a spoiler alert. Uh, that's dumb. I think Grow that was up. was actually a spoiler alert that you just gave. It's called broadcasting. Look yeah. it up, Jess. Sorry, um, <laughs> Sorry dear leader. <laughs> Thank you. Um, wow, she's down with the terms. Yes. She, she, she's she been around. I can't escape him talking about how he's the leader and <laughs> wall this, wall that. Yep. No. I just I'm in. Roam around the office talking about libertarianism. <laughs> I'm the most popular guy there. <laughs> he's <spreading> joy. 
<laughs> and wisdom. When I walked down the hall, doors shut. <laughs> oh, God. How many vaccinations did he have? <laughs> All right, so let's... Not enough. <laughs> right. Uh, so let's talk about just the, the you know, the your, what did you think of the ending of the show and the story arc as a whole? Let's start with Todd Singer. Yeah, I wasn't thrilled. Like, this is not a, uh, you know, hot take. A lot of people think that the last two seasons feel rushed. Um, I thought they could have done a lot more fleshing out. And in the last, you know, the last episode, we got the big scene with Danny and uh, Aegon, mm-hmm. John. Um, that's another. And, that's another thing. Um, normally, we stop and try to catch the newbies up. <laughs> We're just gonna be full nerd. Yeah, We're not, there you go. But it, you know, like, like uh, nobody knows who Aegon is. But you know, John Snow it up if you can. Just so, just so those who are tangentially kind of following. I, I understood. Up. So, so. You know, we get that scene, and then they still have whatever forty minutes left of airtime. But that r- really wasn't enough uh, to me. Um, didn't love the ending. Would have probably preferred something different. But there were some good parts too. And I talked about pre-show how I, I liked how you know Braun is now master of coin, whereas Peter Baelish was master of coin, and Peter Baelish. Uh, got his information through the brothels so he ran the brothels and of course braun his first priority is let's rebuild the brothels right different reason for wanting to do that but uh but still that was i think a nice scene right jessica uh the last episode like i think most people were complaining the whole season was just so rushed yeah because they could have made that at least a season or two alone the last episode should have been two or three episodes and i think had it been spaced out like you know the past seasons i would have been like this is great i didn't see where it was going but instead of having like witty dialogue and like suspense it was like this happened next scene this happens next scene everything was just like back to back Mm -hmm. so i was like ah crap but with where they went with it i mean i was okay with that at first i'm like really can i say literally who gets the throne like yes brand ends up being on the iron throne at the end and right Bran. Bran the Broken. I wanted Jon Snow or right. Daenerys. Somebody, one of those two, but then with Danny not a Mad s- Queen. It not was a like, secondary character who wasn't even in one of the seasons. But silly me, because right. if you thought this was a happy ending, you've been mistaken, a la Ramsey Bolton. So I was okay with it being Bran for the reasoning that Tyrion gives. Um, but Jon Snow just getting sent back to the north, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I mean, he, he belongs up there. You know, he can hang out with the wildling women. And right. Get away from the drama since, you know, Danny's gone. But I, overall, I love the show. The last season just rushed so much. It was like. Yeah. So as a fan, I guess it's easy to complain because you want more. Do we have any idea why this season was so rushed? I don't know. Is it an I, artistic we, we, choice? We, or? we think the show art, the showrunners, Benioff and Weiss, were ready to be done. What I've heard is that HBO gave them license to keep going and gave them the budget. But they had decided that they were ready to move on. Yeah, I think they're ready to work on the new Star Wars. The new Star they're Wars. probably writing a storyline instead of Game of Thrones. And right. Ran and out of. The and good news is, you know, there's no possible issue with upsetting uh, Star Wars fans if they go in the wrong direction. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and that's. Yeah, it really felt upset. to me watching this season, especially this last episode, like C plus homework. You were, you know, you can kind of tell when somebody's just not focused on something, and it really felt like. They just didn't pay attention to the details, and there's little things like in in one of the biggest budget shows of all time, like coffee cups and water bottles in, in the scenes, like that. Those little attention to detail things, you just sort of go, I don't get why this was so. Why did they mess this part up? Part of it up so bad, like, like senioritis in the back end. Yes, but the acting was phenomenal. Yeah, and all the characters I thought did so great. Oh, kitty cat, hello. If if. <laughs> Uh, Peter Dinklage doesn't win Best Actor in something, I will be amazed. I mean, I thought the last three episodes have been his best acting. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know. Okay, but I have a problem with his ending, too. Yeah. So uh, I think George R. R. Martin, the author of the books, is on record as saying that he identifies with Tyrion the most of the all the characters. Right. And the ending to me seemed all, almost like a Mary Sue type thing. Like, I'm going to write a happy ending for my character, mm-hmm. even though it's hard to see how he would have been in that position. Um, 
you know, with with the other dynamics that were in play. Yeah, well, I'll get to Tyrion in my in my wrap up because I don't totally agree. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Tyrion, the man short of stature, ends up being the hand of the king. Um, yes, go ahead, Jen. Did you say that? Oh, I'm, I'm just said, I love your cat. Mittens. Did you say that George R. R. Martin? He's all about you know being circular and bringing everything back, and so or you that was Chris. I did. Chris yeah, said that. Oh, I did. One it was an article. It was an article that I read. Yeah. So then maybe that's like just another one of those characters. Let's bring him back to where they kind of started because yep. he's so good at the game itself, being involved. Whether he wants to continue doing it, it's like no, nope, you have to do this. This yep. is your destiny. And just like Jamie. Well, I mean, you really look at it, and Tyrion ended up positioning himself to be the de facto ruler of the kingdom. I mean, he he put in position to be the king, the weakest person in the game, the person with the least interest in it, who shows up to his first council meeting. And and just kind of shrugs, and then like I'm going to go smoke weed now, <laughs> and like backs away, and then you underestimate Bran, sir. He's um, the mastermind behind the entire story. We'll get to you in a moment, but <laughs> th- that was the moment when I was like, "This is brilliant," because doesn't matter what choice Jon Snow ever made, the wheel was going to continue. Power was going to be exercised in the same way it's always been exercised. You know, a, a Tyrion who's mo- the most clever will position himself to be in power and then bring his friends along. Uh, so so what was your impressions, Chris Galt? It's your turn. Uh, so uh, it sounds like we have, uh, starting between out, the three of you... Just, hold on, just <laughs> starting out smug. Just, you just, you breathe and it's smug. Go ahead. Between the three of you, it sounds like there's a consensus that you would all rewrite it in your own way. And that's fine. Uh, this was like, this episode was kind of like, I'd say the t- the last season, but the ending as a whole was like coming on SSRIs, <laughs> on antidepressants. It's still nice, but it's not great. That's how I'd put it. It's just sort of, meh. And that's why I absolutely love the ending. Of course. Yeah. It's because <laughs> everyone here doesn't like it. Or yeah. doesn't like aspects of it, at least. And I, I think that that's a great storytelling, um, to, have, to have characters um, not do what they wouldn't normally do in a fairy tale type world like that. Like, a, like Jamie's fall was probably my favorite part, um, in which, when I'm reading, it seems like that's most people's least favorite part. Um, Jamie basically going back to Cersei yeah, and dying. And because I'm, that's what his whole story was. He only ever loved one person in his whole life. Right. And and when he was with Brienne, you could see it in his face the whole time he was there that it wasn't the same for him. It wasn't like like the, his his true love, his sister. <laughs> 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 but is what it is. But nice. I loved that he fell back to his addiction and... and, and it was real. It was a real moment for a character that I don't feel like you get in very many shows. It was almost like, um, kind of like Walter White in Breaking Bad's a good character that you see break. You know, I agree. And I agree with you about Jamie. I agree that he's the most realistic person because at the end of the day, we are all like people. No matter how hard they try to change their spots, and no matter how hard they try to be noble and do the right thing, like you always eventually kind of fall back into some of those worst patterns and then have to keep fighting those demons. Yeah. I think he was a very conflicted character, and I th- I think that he had a really good story arc. Yeah, and then um, with Tyrion saving his life, you know, in the in the camp, uh, I think that was a really great moment for Tyrion because he went he left there and, and he knew that that was the end of his life. Like he gave up his life for his brother. Yeah. And eventually that, that would come back to him. And um, th- that's why when uh, when they showed him in the rubble, like someone in my watch- viewing party said, "Oh, why are they showing that?" Like, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh. "Yeah, but that's well, they're I showing this I for don't know, Tyrion." Maybe top five characters, like, well, <laughs> yeah, and uh, on screen death, I guess, because they kind of flashed away, um, and no one you don't want that as a loose end, you know, right. thinking Cersei's still alive somewhere in the theory boards, uh, uh, right? Um, Which it was so good call that they yeah. showed that. Yeah, <laughs> but you said. Uh, Jamie never loved any other person, yeah. but I think it's pretty clear he loved Tyrion. I mean, he oh, several times okay. put himself on the line for his brother. Yeah, you know, uh, convinced Tywin to, to not execute him. Yeah, help, he helped him escape in, in other places. Like you're right, and of course Tyrion references that. Like I, I wouldn't even be. I think that alive scene. I think you. that scene of Tyrion saying goodbye to Jamie was one of the best scenes in the whole show. I yeah. thought it was super touching and 
well acted by Peter Dinklage. And I think there were a lot of those moments in the season that w- that I think people will start to realize when we all rewatch it again, like we have the first five or six seasons. We've all watched it like five or six times, I'm sure. And uh, once we watch this one a few more times, we'll start to like some of those moments a little bit more and start to understand some of those holes. Because I don't know about you guys, but like... Uh, if it was season six right now and I went back for a rewatch, there are things in those seasons that I would notice that I did not notice. So every single rewatch, I would learn more things and connections with those characters. Yeah. And that like, will happen in this new season. It's like the exact same. For example, same. Daenerys at one point tells Varys flat out, I will burn you alive if you betray yeah. me. Well, yeah. wasn't wasn't there a dream sequence of her walking into the throne room in snow? Yep. She's in the house of the, un- is the, it undying. the undying. Undying. Mm-hmm, with yeah. the warlock. And, and at she first, burns him with the little baby like, dragons. It's like, snow? And then you're like, oh, no, it's ash. But then yep. it really did, they did bring winter yep. to uh, King's Landing. So I guess it was snow, but she never touched it. It was kind of dream. both. <laughs> right. snow so and as ash. soon as she gets close to the throne, and then she ends up going to what looks like north of the wall, and she sees Khal Drogo and her baby. Right. didn't make it, but apparently that's her going into the afterlife to mm. join them. Mm-hmm. So I guess the sun rising in the east, setting in the west... Or yeah. what was it? No, sun rises in the west and sets in the east. Mm-hmm. How does the sun actually do it? It's the opposite of how the real sun starts does it. in the east and ends in the west. <laughs> oh, yeah. This no, is backwards. easy it's to remember. There. You just watched the great '80s movie, The Muppets mo- Muppet Movie, <laughs> and they, the song says, "Hey, I've never seen the sun come out in the west." And that's that's how you remember. You, you may be too young for that movie. Yeah, I don't just get a map. Sorry. Sorry, just look out my window. Yeah, <laughs> how does the map help with the Yeah, sunset? but besides um, <laughs> Jamie and Tyrion, um, I really liked all the Starks endings. Um, all three of them. Um, they're all, all four of them. They're all uh, kings and queens in their own regards. Um, they all went in their own ways. They all get to live lives that they chose. Um, Sansa it wanted to be queen since day one. Mm-hmm. That's what all she was saying the whole time. And Arya has said earlier in the series that she wanted to sail sail west and explore. And, you know, Bran, Bran didn't vocalize what he wanted, but he wanted to be king, or he knew that he was going to be king, at least, as he said in that knowing last episode. Or, knowing and wanting are two different things. Why do you think he wanted it? Is there anything that leads you or any of you to believe that he wanted to be king? Or he was no, just he sort said of... No, he, he said that he does not want he just it's accepts. just a necessary thing, right? Mm-hmm. But and then John is also the king beyond the wall. So I think they all got their great endings. Um, that's the only place John really belonged was when he was north of the wall with with Egret, which was some of my favorite times. When they were else. walking out, I really wanted to see a White Walker. I was really hoping, like, <laughs> I'd love that suspense of uh, that's what I thought was going to happen as they're walking, kind of all the, the parading north. And they'd see the Night King or a White Walker. I was like, oh, please, we please. missed one. So yeah. you want more White Walkers? I just a uh, continuation. That's of what they're gonna everything. do. Yeah. The the uh, new series they're gonna do is called The Long Night. Oh, is it? Mm-hmm. And it's the prequel for uh, the original. What time are, the White Walkers came? What are the spinoffs? That's the one they're gonna do. Okay. Right. Just that, that one. I mean, no. Chilla George R. R. Mar- George R. R. Martin is committed to up to five, to helping write up to five. He's laughing the whole time. Five I'll help you with five, five. spinoff I just series. Need to get one book out that's been waiting. Five ten new years. series. <laughs> yeah. Spinoff series. Uh, not for nothing, but as a man of larger carriage, can we get the? Can we get you to finish the book series before you know? <laughs> yeah, like, I know that's <laughs> right. No. Like, hit the treadmill. He's and he cashing in. I don't yeah. think. I don't think he'll write another book because. <laughs> Has he, he hasn't finished. He's got Winds like what? Winds of Winter is just out there chilling, right? Right. He's got huh. what? Two more to finish? Well, he was like, eh, some people didn't like the ending. I might just, you know, blame James it on D and D and not put out my books yeah. so they don't hate me. Right. D and D being the showrunners, right, the, the guys that basically were in charge, like the David Chase, the the uh, who's the Sopranos guy, uh, or Dick Wolf for Law and Order. Um, right. So f- my my impressions. Knowing that now that I know that they're going to do spinoffs, things make sense. Like you're going to send John North, you're going to send Arya out west, you know, to find new lands, and she's a, you know, a colonialist. Uh, that stuff makes sense if you're doing spinoffs. But from a classic story point, like if you ever read the Hero's Journey, I think it's the Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell, where basically the the general story arc it's it's very influential on uh, George Lucas and Star Wars. You take somebody who's in a low rank, somebody who's kind of poor or young or an upstart, 
they they feel an injustice in the world they meet a guide who helps them kind of discover their true power and then the hero defeats the evil empire with the help of the guide and uh there's trials and tribulations along the way and usually a romantic interest and like that's the classic storytelling formula that that pretty much everything joseph campbell just kind of identified through all of mythology and history and all of our literature like these these main themes there's another guy uh, the seven basic plots where he identifies like the seven basic plots that all stories kind of follow and so there's some stuff in this where there's discord between classic storytelling and the way that this wrapped up you have Jon Snow who is resurrected who is the main sto- character of the story who is you know raised from the dead he defeats at the battle of the bastard he like has all these huge moments and then he just becomes sort of this silent, neutered person in the last episode, especially. Whoa, like, whoa, whoa. But that's after he saves potentially millions of people. Mm-hmm. The entire world. W- the known world. Maybe. So, he, yes, there is that scene, but at the and end Tyrion. of Tyrion. He at least saves Tyrion. He's, he's going, but she's my queen. Like, you just saw her nuke an entire town of a million people. Like, she's still your queen. You should be... He you should be her. reacting like, if you're a man of honor, you'd go, like Ned Stark, you'd go the way of Tyrion and Varys, and you'd stop her, which he ultimately did, but he had conflict over it. It was just sort of ham- Love is the death of duty. But it was, that whole thing was just sort of crammed. It was just odd, and it didn't Amen fit right. That. Like, Amen did it feel that. rushed? <laughs> not, not just rush, but just like how many times can you guys say rushed in this just podcast? Bad storytelling. Like, I'm from Rushville. Oh, wow. Bad huh? storytelling because it subverted your expectations. It was no, bad. because it's bad storytelling. What was bad about it? What part of the story was bad? That particular besides that you disagreed with the outcome. The fact that the whole show is about the the North Daenerys Targaryen, the Northmen specifically. Oh, oh it's about the Northmen and the Star. Would you shut the f- uh, shut up? Thank you. Oh no. This story, Am I witnessing this the beginning of the just, end here? This story is much larger than one character, or one town, but or But when one you're area. talking about the Starks story arc, you're talking about men who just do the right thing no matter the cost, and then they're men of honor, and then you get to the last episode, and he completely betrays that by waffling on whether or not he should stop Daenerys Targaryen, who just we just witnessed one of the great tyrannical scenes of all of television history like it's like watching and you didn't want any Nuremberg. conflict in in his mind about to stab the woman that he loved you didn't want any conflict because there? he knew he had to kill her the only way to stop her would be to kill her yeah right and he was the only one that could and that's what sucked that's conflict do you guys from the oh. acting from the storytelling do you guys there there are two things that are really missing around denarius and john in this season in my mind First is the deterioration of Daenerys into a, a madman. The the most that we really get are some like weird, pensive. It looked like she had diarrhea that she was holding in in her face and made this angry face, and then she just became crazy. There was never any like dialogue around her being crazy. It was just weird faces. And then second was the love interest. It's like he is he in love because every time she's tried to kiss him, he's pulled away from her, and now he's wrestling with whether or not he loves her or not. Whoa. It just didn't make any sense because he found out she was his auntie. He's <laughs> right. like, auntie, I don't want to make out with you anymore. It's kind of weird. Thank I know you. you grew up that way where you all married your sister wife. Yep. You know, Aegon with his sister wives, Conqueror Westeros. And I'm just saying, but... if I, my fir- mm. if I find out last week that she's my first cousin and this week that she's a genocidal maniac my love isn't as strong right i'm not i'm not otis redding over here so Uh, see this is this is why it's beautiful because she was a suicidal maniac the entire time she was just killing people that were bad she loved burning the dothraki villages down she loved conquering those cities she loved killing the dead the slave she loved it all she loved she loved she used fire and blood the entire show but she never killed the good people until the end Right. So that's she why did the, the exact same thing she'd done to all the other villages. Right. And lazy writing kind of to speed things up. That's why they put Tyrion in the last episode to basically explain that to people that might right. have a problem with her all of a sudden flipping to Mad Queen. He's like, no, 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 it's been there the whole time. Let me tell you. It, it, r- exactly right. And what happened with Varys in the notes that he sent around to all the kingdoms? And like you had to see a meme to notice that he was trying to poison her. Like they're just like these little sloppy things that you go, I don't get why. Jon Snow gets neutered from a, from a story perspective, and and then he is that he's bargained over. Even though he's the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms, he gets bargained over, and then the 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 unsullied 
leave, and then his brother who's king and his sister who's North King, they don't go, hey, well, now that they're gone, that deal's off. You can do whatever you want. You can stay here if you'd like. Like, you, like I, I, they, they have this weird tortured scene on the dock where they all see the ships going away, and they're like, yeah, but you still have to go not fuck some chicks at the wall like sorry bro like i know that you i know you did a lot for us you did a lot like it just some of it didn't make sense and then aria aria never gets any kind of glory for killing the night king what scene did we see her get crowned they toasted her at winterfell oh oh, okay she wasn't there we could go to shallow's antique (laughs) restaurant right now and toast you like i would like that you should do that please all right fine take pictures great chips so (laughs) So okay. there were so you say that doesn't make sense. W- which part? That that John was sent to the to the castle black. Yes. If you can explain to join the Night's Watch. If I you can. can explain to me. I can. Other than we we need to cash out on a on a spin-off series. So uh, like Arya's Arya's <laughs> Arya's ending made complete sense. Sansa complete sense. Daenerys complete sense. Jon Snow I don't get what they were doing with Jon Snow. He's back to where he started too. He was he was the the Christ like figure throughout this whole thing, and then like he's not he's just flops at the end. So um, he was sent to join the Night's Watch. Mm-hmm. There is no Night's Watch, Chris Spangle. Okay. So when Tyrion said that, there should have been a big wink. Ah, okay. Hey, All right. you go join your buddies up there at the wall. You have a whole entire other queen in between us and you. Right. You do what you want. There's no more White Walker threat. There's no more Wildling threat, which was what the wall was there for. Mm-hmm. It was perfect. All right, I can see that. Thank you. You get to go live. All right, I can buy that. I thought he was just sent to go. He was just the Lord Commander now of the Night's Watch, whatever that was, to right. take in the people of, you know, the seven or six kingdoms in the north that maybe yeah. they break the law or they're the... Outcast of their family, like I, your Samwells. That, that's I, why they. Sh- that's why he walked out the gate. You well, know, I in thought, spring, and, but and I thought he behind was, him, and he was walking with the well, wildlings out because but, he's not staying at Castle Black. He's I know, free. but I thought he was going Galt. That's why part of why I like the ending. You've ruined the only part of his ending that I liked is that a, a character went Galt <laughs> and said, "I'm I'm walking away from the world that you nuts have created, and I'm going Galt in the north." I know that's why I loved it. <laughs> right, and you've ruined that for me now. No, it's great. You're still. It's still true. I, uh, here's what I will say, and this Grey is... Grey Worm doesn't know that. Grey so, Worm thinks he's, you know, r- well, shackled Grey, up there Grey Worm's training going to the beach. criminals. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, here's what I really did like about it. Um, I thought that the, the scene with Daenerys was a... Uh, the great thing about this series as a whole is it really illustrates for us political power. It really kind of shows you the the absurdity of political power and the absurdity of uh, trying to rule over others and how it corrupts people wholly, even decent people that you think, like Daenerys, you think she's a decent person, she's going to save everyone, she's going to break the wheel, but she just turns out to be another dictator who's going to destroy the world. Uh, and I thought that that scene, the the taking her from a person that you're really rooting for to a person that you despise by the end was a great example of how power completely corrupts both the person who is seeking power and also how many innocent people it hurts in the process. And I thought that the dragon seeing the throne as the thing that killed Daenerys, while being a bit obvious was very apropos and a really good ending to that entire arc. And I think one that we can, as libertarians, really apply to how we how we view political power. I mean, have you thought about it in that? In that? I kind of thought Drogon was just kind of breathing fire in general, which ended up, in a result, right. melting the throne. Because he wasn't necessarily aiming right at it. He was just like, ah, like screaming. Yeah. But in the result of it, melting it down. Well, he wasn't going to kill the last Targaryen. I know, but I really did want Drogon to kind of breathe fire at Jon and be like, oh, look, he's unburnt. What? And then he just started to worship him, kind of. Right. And then he'll be like, go away. I gave up ghosts. I can't hang out with you. Yeah. And then they all go live in the north together. (laughs) (laughs) What did you think about that arc? Well, a couple things. Mm -hmm. Um, One, while the Starks have been portrayed as honorable throughout the series, they've also been portrayed as, how do I put this delicately, Stupid. 
So my first question is, how did they find out that John put a knife through her heart? Like, why shouldn't he have Thank just you. cut his arm and said, um, you know, the dragon came in, freaked out, she flew off, I don't know where they went, and I got cut. <laughs> exactly. You were waiting for for uh, Grey Worm to run in I mean, and arrest him. I mean, is it possible that, Grey, that he, John just said, oh, yeah, I killed her? Nobody. It's possible because he that's did. the kind of person that's, that he's... He's honorable. Does. He would tell the I truth. I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> John, I mean, the only explanation that you don't get is Jon Snow told on himself, which is so stupid. He could have walked out and been like, I'm the king. He could have climbed yeah. on that dragon, <laughs> and then he could, have, yep. he could have killed the Unsullied. He could have killed and said, Daenerys Targaryen was a traitor. I, I'm saving it. And then... You know, or taking the dragon to fight the Unsullied with his sisters and all the yep. Northmen and everybody else, and s- instead you get Tyrion waking up in a prison three weeks w- later, and Jon's a prisoner for it what is reason? Stupid, but it's not out of character. Well, because I, he could be. I get he it. Could be. I get he is it. That stupid. Just like Ned, he knows I have nothing. This letter. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. What letter? It's like, dang, good one, Cersei. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I want to think about that. I, I, I referenced it. real quick before we started, you know, how I would have rewritten the ending. And, and mine would have been that, you know, uh, Drogon kind of bends down toward John. John touches his snout and climbs up on him and says, right. I'm the last Targar- Targaryen. Mm. And look at me. I'm, I'm the dragon. captain. Of, I'm the captain and, and, of the ship. Right. And the dragon recognizes dr- him as, a, as a Targaryen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been pretty but, good. But they didn't if he left on his own terms yeah. instead of being forced to leave. I just would have liked to see that, that episode though of the conflict of them finding John, how he does it. That's again, that right there is an entire episode. Or if we could just jump yeah. cut, it's grow a whole a beard, book that you know you get to read all the books and you get all the thrones you've ever wanted. He's not gonna Hopefully. make it. Let's be honest. Um, what? He's too busy. He's he's. But sh- I mean, she's still got some books to read. Uh, yeah. So Cato actually did an entire breakdown, I think maybe yesterday, um, about, no, this is 2017, uh, looks like. Cato did, uh, I'll put it in the show notes and the link to the Guardian article that I pulled this from, um, but one of the guys in the panel discussion on the power and Game of Thrones said, there's a lot of talk about breaking the wheel, but there's really little analysis of what the wheel is made of, what it would take to break it, and what you would build in its place. And another guy agreed, it seems like Daenerys is thinking about what the system will be like, hasn't progressed beyond, I will be on the throne, and I will not be a bad person like my father was, like Cersei Mm -hmm. is, like these other people are. But he felt that our own world was not immune to that sort of thinking. You can see it in even today liberal democratic societies where candidates promise us things like, I will bring you change you can believe in, or you give me power, I can only do it, I'll solve your problems. I only can do it if you let me solve your problems. Excuse me. That's a better and easier campaign strategy than I will build some good institutions. That doesn't fit into your 30-second ad very well. Uh, and and that's very true. And, and so you sort of look at it, and I don't think a lot of us sit and examine what what it takes to build political power. And I think libertarians especially, we I, I look at libertarians and I think, you know, Denarius doesn't think about what will it take to replace the wheel, Libertarians spend so much time talking about hating government, and they focus solely on... on, uh, I heard Michael Malice talk about his new book on Glenn Beck this uh, past week, and it was just a really great uh, conversation that Malice had. You can find it on Beck's uh, SoundCloud, where he talked about libertarians and the right in general... Listening to Tyrion was a huge step. Sorry. Yeah. We're back online. We're back. We're back on live. We're back. I uh, don't quite know what happened there. I sorry, apologize. You, sorry you missed us, but I can assure the audience that what we said <laughs> was both insightful and witty. <laughs> nah, I just took my pants off. Um, um, you're talking about this though, and I think that it the moment in the fi- final episode that you're that talks about what you're saying is is when uh, or a good moment at least was when they were laughing about uh, capitalism or I mean uh, a democracy, democracy. It, and r- right. Uh, and they, you know, they just dismissed it so easy. And, and that was going into the final season. That was my hope. I was hoping that they would just destroy the throne and that they would vote and, you know, become a democracy. And I thought that would be a great ending. Yeah. So, and, but it was way more realistic that they laughed it off. And I, but I like that they addressed it and, and that it was there. And I thought I really liked that part. Yeah. So they come out of it and uh, they literally laugh in the face. And then they let Tyrion essentially, in my opinion, maneuver himself into to ruling the realm and the, the the people who are in control maintain control 
with a few minor exceptions that it will you know it's not going to be it's just minor tweaks it's um what did i see let me look at my notes here that uh i thought was kind of um a person uh, i forget what article i was reading but i just grabbed this real quick now uh, it was on vox uh now my personal preference it was vox's recap of game of thrones he writes, uh, now my personal preference was always Tyrion and Vince democracy as a way to wrap up this series, and he sort of did that, proposing that the lords and ladies of the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms choose all future rulers. Still, the very idea of Bran ending up as king is a bit ridiculous, but maybe that's the point. Everyone yeah. chuckles at the very notion of a democracy that allows everybody in the Seven Kingdoms a vote when Sam Tarly proposes it. Maybe the Seven Kingdoms need to struggle along in monarchy for a while longer, and if they do, well, why not have an all-seeing demigod on the throne to flatly intone about tax policies and land usage along with the king? But I thought that was a That's great point good. in that we see that and we go, why wouldn't they choose democracy? But if you really think, I think as libertarians, we sort of look at the current, the current state of our, our choices and how we make choices, and we go, well, isn't this all patent re- patently ridiculous? I think somebody from 1300 will go, well, it's way better ordered with a king. Uh, why w- way better than this? Like, what are you talking about? Like, you don't you don't have freedom, just like we don't have freedom uh, to do what you want, within certain exceptions. So, so I don't know. I think that again, going back to um, the scene where Tyrion maneuvers himself into the being the king, he comes in, he puts all the chairs in order, sits in the chair. They come in, they talk about what the brothels. They start arguing about brothels. And versus, do we help people or do we build brothels? And they're talking about absurd nonsense. Those are not mutually exclusive <laughs> options. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're talking about absurd nonsense, and you just sort of go, as it pulled back, I just went, holy shit, this is brilliant. And I don't know if I said it earlier, but it was the moment for me when I realized it doesn't matter what choice Jon Snow made. The wheel will continue, meaning people will always think that they ought to rule over others and will stop at nothing to get to that place. And if you study anything about history or our history or the world's history, the more you study history, the more you start to see our own times and our own behaviors and people of the past, especially now that you have histories that are much more, uh, much less propagandistic and trying to push a certain narrative. Now it's more, this is who the real person was. This is what actually happened. You you start to see... um, that it really doesn't matter how much, what you do, even if you're Jon Snow putting a knife in the heart of Daenerys, you're going to get the wheel. You're going to get people trying to to rule over others. And all of these innocent people that are that are nuked are all, it doesn't matter. They were all going to be victims of the five people. Like, we all love the characters in Game of Thrones. We love those people. But if you're just a peasant in Game of Thrones time, those are their, those are their tormentors. Those are the people that are oppressing them. And their their petty little differences and fights are the ones that cost them their lives over this throne. And and you just see the absurdity of it all and you start to kind of go, Wow, this is this is brilliant because they really illustrated a couple things very well in that the the fall of Daenerys, the Barack Obama figure who ends up being, you know, or the, the, the we love this guy. Oh, what a disappointment. And he killed a lot of people with drones. Uh, or you get um, just the fact that we're always going to kind of repeat the same history unless we start to make some changes about our own behaviors and choices. You look like you have something to say, Todd. No, well, just I don't want to get too far into politics. Uh, (laughs) But when we talk about democracy, one of the things I think that makes the U.S. an exception is our, our leaders have been hesitant to deploy our military domestically. When we try to export democracy to other countries, hey, that's part of the deal. If I get control of the military, then my clan, my family gets to be in power and get certain rights, and I'm going to punish the people that uh, trod on me uh, before. And right. I don't know exactly why, maybe an accident of history, but in the U.S. we see it as, oh, no, you really shouldn't deploy those Troops, you know, it's okay around the around the world, but around, around you know here, we're not necessarily going to listen to a president that says, "Hey, you know, go arrest my political enemies." I think one of the clearest examples of this was who's who's the guy that talked about brothels, the, the Braun Braun, the guy that says cock every episode. 
Uh, he 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 said it best when he had the the thing up against the head of the Lannisters. Do you the think crossbow. it's a crossbow? The, the thing. The, the thing. thing. Crossbow. Thank you. He goes. You've never seen a crossbow, have you? All these great houses. It's it's some rough bastard like me. A cutthroat, basically. A cutthroat yeah. that started these houses that was ruthless enough to put themselves in this position. A cutthroat that took Castle R- Castlery Rock and, that's and then all yep. you, <laughs> and then all you grandsons of the cutthroats do all your cock sucking and ruin everything. <laughs> and, it, yep. just, and I thought. He learned it Damn, from the Lannisters. Right. Where, yeah. do you, mm-hmm. where, do you think Lannister. the, where do you think the Bushes got their money? Launder, uh, laundering Nazi gold. <laughs> where do you think Trump's <laughs> Where do you think Trump's money came from? Trump's grandfather ran a brothel in in California or Alaska or somewhere. You know, it's it, wealth is built by the people who act like Donald Trump, unfortunately. And then the rest of us are all just I'm just going to be nice, <laughs> it sucks. Uh, so, but I thought that was a very clear moment. Um, so, you know, you actually put together some examples. Yes, two pages Sorry. worth, and we're going to go over these in meticulous detail, <laughs> one by one. Oh, I'm just kidding. But this you, is really cool. But you kind of, <laughs> you kind of see, you know, Power Illustrated kind of walk us through some of this, and I'll put the this into the show notes if you kind of want this summary. You know, and really, what I wanted to talk about tonight was how does political power corrupt? Both the people and hurt hurt the innocent that they're trying to rule over, you know. And you really did a great job. You can go and check out this list in the show notes. Um, but just, you know, to to not have themselves told on, they push Bran out of a window. Uh, Daenerys is sold to call Drago. And at that point, Daenerys is an innocent, right? She's just right. a young girl that her brother sees as a way to gain power so he can sell her off in exchange for soldiers. Right. Uh, King Robert orders assassins to go kill Daenerys, who's innocent at that point. You know, Joffrey. I mean, Joffrey was just one big giant abuse of power. Um, Theon kills two innocent children in place of Bran and Rickon Stark. Um, you know, the Red Wedding. Um, slavers of Marine have crucified children as a message to Daenerys and her army as they approach. Wildlings attack the wall out of desperation and they're repelled in season four. Um, obviously, season the, the five. The Red Wedding is another example of that same kind of um, cheering that you were doing for Daenerys the whole time she was slaughtering the slavers and, you know, the evil the evil horse riders, mm-hmm. you know, um, the red wedding is, is they killed all the people you loved and it was brutal and you cried and it was terrible. And it was right. the worst thing you ever saw on television. So but then you cheered when Arya Stark went there and slaughtered another family. Right. Because, but it was basically the exact same thing, you know, but we cheered for that because of who it was. Right. Because they were on our side, they were yeah. on our team, but the other side, and those sometimes that's just not black and white. Like it, in reality, in the world we live in, that's why I like Game of Thrones is is a lot more complex like our world. It's not so black and white like Lord of the Rings or something, you know? And they kind of cover this in the books where Tywin and has a conversation with, with Tyrion about the Red Wedding, and Tyrion's like, why in the world would you, would you do that? And, and Tywin says, well, we could have had a battle in the open field, and a bunch of our people would have died too, and so is th- doing this way any worse? Mm-hmm. And as a reader, my answer is, yeah, it's a ton worse because at the time, the the rules of hospitality said, if you're our invited guest, you're safe here, even if we're warring. Do, Tywin, do you plan on being at war forever? Because it would be nice to not have war at some point, and then by doing this, that rule is mm-hmm. gone. Now no one is going to be feel safe ever again, or at least for not, you know, 100 years or generations or whatever. Right. So I... I you, you sure you can see the brutal logic, but that's not thinking very far ahead, in my opinion. Yeah. So the Lannisters are the are the Americans, and you are, you're the wife of an American soldier, a Lannister soldier, and your king or your ruler, your their president just ended the war, right? With a CIA oper- operation, you know, so no soldiers needed to be deployed. You're super happy, right? You know, your husband's not going to be deployed. No risk of death. You're praising your government. For that, for it, that action, which it, is to to put a cap on what you're saying is that we we don't see all life as equal, and we should. Yeah, right. Well, I cheered for Arya when she killed all the Frey soldiers because she didn't kill like his daughters, but at the red wedding, Caitlyn she gone, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Rob Stark's wife and baby gone. Like right. the women were on the table as well to kill, but she was no. I'm just going to kill the soldiers that helped fac- facilitate the Red Wedding. Just yeah. justice and honor, and the innocent are are right. let go. Yeah. Right. So if you're going to kill, just kill the bad guys? Question mark. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Not just indiscriminate killing. That's why you didn't have a problem with Daenerys using the dragons against the the men on the uh, the the planks of the the walls. Because they're fighting against her, they've they've made the, the, cho- pe- the they, pe- okay, go ahead, they've allegedly made the choice or been conscripted into that position, which, and, and then when they all surrender, we're all mad because she's killing innocent people. the The reason that you have so much tension when Grey Worm is killing um, surrendered soldiers is that they're not posing a threat. They're bending the knee. They're they've given up their position and said, "I no longer will fight against you." And they almost click into that innocent status, and that's why you you feel that tug that this is in, this is unjust that you're not supposed to do this. This is it's dishonorable. A, the rules of war, like right. we surrender, cool, we won, fights over. Right, exactly. So uh, that's you know justice does make a difference. You know if you're if you're talking about the death penalty, you know killing there's a di- there's a difference. I'm against the death penalty totally, but if you know, it's Ted Bundy, and it's pretty clear that he committed all these murders versus a guy who's had a bunch of questions and he might be innocent. Like, in our minds, there's always that, like, that that tug. Like, it's it's just to kill someone who's committed a lot of murders. It's unjust to kill someone who hasn't. The, so. the people of King's Landing are not without sin. In what way? In the way that they yelled for the beheading of Ned Stark and, the, and, yeah. and convinced Joffrey to do it. In the way that they threw shit at Cersei Lannister as she walked down the streets back to the castle, right. the people of King's Landing—it's all about perspective. They're not—they're not innocent. Yeah, but that's really a misdemeanor. I don't think you can <laughs> call for capital punishment. It depends for on who shit. you are. For if shit, they threw bro. shit at you, you might think different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think so. So let me maybe. ask. So let's kind of. Uh, I found some uh, questions on some. I wish I had actually saved the site, so I apologize if I'm ripping off your work, but I don't believe in IP, so suck it, bruh. Uh, <laughs> um, so th- these were some questions in a college course about the books, but I thought they were really kind of interesting questions, and it's questions about power. So uh, where does power come from, and what do people do with it? And here's the bottom line. In a Game of Thrones, power isn't anything close to absolute. Power is continually shifting and changing, even when you've got it, there's always someone else who's ready to snatch it from you. Uh, so, you know, maybe we could try defining power and where it comes from and skip what do people do with it. But in terms of political power, we tend to think of like Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, an absolute power, probably the most powerful monarch in the history of Europe. And he had absolute power, total control. If you watch the miniseries Versailles on Netflix, great, by the way. Uh, then you kind of see this displayed. Um, but in something like that, or if you read about um, kings of old, like even a, an absolute monarch in Europe in 1650 or King Henry VIII, they still had rules. Like there there were always people trying to take power from them. Their power was shifting or waning. You know, King Charles, who led to, who basically uh, ended up being <laughs> dethroned, uh, in the first English Civil War, uh, did some things that just kind of led the the sands underneath him to fall out be- beneath him. So, and, and we tend to think in America, I mean, we tend to think that the American government is just all-powerful and nothing can change it. But it can lose legitimacy if we want it to. I mean, it, it's it's really... So, so in your opinions, where does power come from? Are you talking historically or in the modern age? Let's talk about right now, relevant to the listener. All right. I'll go with delegation. I'll go at the barrel of a gun. I, I say that, you know, as, as common citizens, we've essentially delegated, like, uh, you know what, we don't want to, like, really be protecting our property all the time. Uh, we're going to elect leaders to make all these rules, and that way I can, you know, speaking for myself, I can go play video games when I'm done with work. Right. Galt, you said at the barrel of a gun. What do you mean? Um, because while he's playing video games, if he wants to light up a joint here in Indiana, if they smell it outside, they'll kick down his door and take him to jail. Right. That's because most of the citizens 
will not protest. I won't say that they agree, but they will not protest that rule. So, Jess, you're not a political person necessarily. Uh, so I won't ask you to answer if you don't want to, but like, have you thought about where political power comes from, what the nature of it, or is it just something that you don't really think much about? I try not to, because it usually makes me sad. You delegated it. And it's it. because, exactly, I delegated <laughs> it then, because I feel like the media tries to tell me what to think, depending on where I'm watching or looking, and social media always tells me what to think, and it just makes me frustrated because right. I would like to think for myself, which I will not do either because <laughs> it just makes me sad. Uh, so ignorance is bliss, I guess. I'll plead that way, but I mean, in Game of Thrones, because I was so excited, we started talking about power. <laughs> Little fingers quote to Cersei, yeah. and he's getting all cocky. He's like, knowledge is power, mm -hmm. and Cersei's like, um, take two steps forward to her soldiers. Kill Peter Baelish or whatever, and they start to kill him. She's like, no, don't. I changed my mind. Now take two steps back. And her whole point is, Turn no, around. power is power, not knowledge. So you can know all the things, but it doesn't matter because if you're in charge, you're in charge, and you have all the power. What was the power that she was exhibiting? That Cersei was exhibiting? Well, the barrel of a knife. Right. <laughs> a sword. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's the person who mm -hmm. feels that they legitimately have the ability to kill you. And, and the person that won the throne won it at... I mean the barrel of a WMD, which is <laughs> which is the thinking behind that was her weapon of mass destruction. You know the dragon, which is the thinking behind that the term taxation is theft, for instance. You know that uh, if you don't comply, then men in costumes are going to come and arrest you and put you in jail. Right. Uh, you know I think this would actually be a good time. Let's play this for our our good friend Jessica. Uh, you may not have heard this. Can somebody give her headphones? You may have heard Marshall Fritz's uh, uh, explanation. Were you playing in your office before? Uh, no, I don't think so. I hear a lot of Shapiro in there. I, I, I try to uh, not. I try not to. Uh, uh, what's the term? Propagandize you too much. Uh, but this is a guy named Marshall. Jonathan. This is a guy named Marshall Fritz talking in uh, the eighties. The Cato Institute actually saved this audio. And Marshall Fritz founded the Advocates for Self-Government, uh, which is, are the quiz people. And probably he's on Mount Rushmore, like Ron Paul, Murray Rothbard, Hayek, and Marshall Fritz. And he's the one that nobody knows, but he's the guy who really empowered the grassroots in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s to get out there and work. And uh, this is him. C can you repeat who's on Mount Rushmore again for me? George Washington. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Not, on, <laughs> not my Mount Rushmore. Uh, but... But this is uh, Marshall Fritz asking people to examine their principles. If someone were to come into your house, he's uh, wearing a ski mask, he's carrying a shotgun, gets the drop on you, and he robs you of a bunch of your stuff. In your opinion, is, uh, is there something wrong with that? Yeah, yeah sure, he says, yeah, didn't, that's an easy one. How many of us would agree with John? That's obvious, he's saying, yeah, okay, good. Edgel, two people come into your home. Again, they're wearing the ski mask, they get the drop on you and all that sort of stuff. They're, they're cleaning out some of your stuff. You've got this great big built-in television set, and there's this argument that ensues, uh, do they have enough time to get the TV set out of there? And you bring up that your brother-in-law, a uh, highway patrolman, is a uh, do-over any minute <laughs> to, to watch the game. It might be best that there, there isn't time. And they sort of decide to vote on it. And it turns out the vote is two to one and they take the TV set. Edgel, does the process of taking your stuff become morally okay if you're allowed to vote on it? If they employ democratic principles and allow you to vote? No. How many of us think that uh, if you get to vote on it, it's okay if people take your stuff? Only if you have a big family. <laughs> Only if you have a big family. <laughs> Martha, three of them come into uh, uh, your house, uh, this time they're not even wearing, um, they're very brazen now, they're not wearing uh, ski masks, uh, they're dressed in suits and all that sort of thing. You can see that they're carrying guns. And they've prepared a, a list of things that they want you to, to give them, uh, including your Mercedes. Uh, but one of them comments, he says, you know, Martha, young, uh, delightful people like you uh, should be in uh, an exercise program. And while we are going to take your Mercedes, we're going to give you this nice Schwinn. And we encourage you to uh, ride to work and ride to play and whatever. So they, they leave and all. Is it okay if someone takes your Mercedes as long as you get something, some return on your investment? You got the Schwinn out of it. Is it okay now? Not a good return on investment. Not a, not a good return, but is it, is the, does the morality of their taking your car change because they left you something behind? You got something good out of it. You got the Schwinn. Did the morality of the theft change because you got something? No. No. How many of us agree with Martha that the morality did not change? Okay, good. Bill, there you are. All right. Four of them come into your... Uh, 
shop. Same thing with the Mercedes and the list and all this kind of a stuff. But they do one more thing. Uh, Bill, they're going to not only give you a Schwinn, but they're going to give a Schwinn to a poor person down in Paraguay who needs a Schwinn in order for her to get to work and all and support her family. Let's uh, say a couple of things here. One, you have not only a generic belief and in, in, in value in helping disadvantaged people, but you have a very specific uh, burden on your heart for the people of Paraguay. Uh, you lived down there as a kid, your mom was the ambassador, you went back in the, uh, uh, in the Peace Corps, and you've got this great sense for the people of Paraguay. Bill, does it, is it morally okay for someone to take your Mercedes if they do something that you consider good with some of the proceeds? Not morally okay. Not, that does not become morally okay, in your opinion. How many of us agree with Bill that even though they're doing something sort of nice that we approve of, it doesn't become more, the morality of it doesn't change? All right. Uh, let's see, what are we up to? Four. Chris, what if we had 14 in the group? Would it be okay then? I don't think so. No? <laughs> uh, Richard, 40? Philip, 400? Uh, Linda, 4,000? 4 million, Phyllis? 104 million? Hey, watch it, guys. You're, you're wrecking the carpet. I think libertarianism is the basic principles that your mom and dad, in all likelihood, taught you. They're the principles that my mom and dad taught me. Morality does not come from what the group decides. How many of us tell our uh, teenage children, well, you just find out what everybody else is doing and then you do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's not the way we decide morality. So that is Marshall Fritz talking about the morality uh, of voting and taxation and government and power. What are your impressions of that, Jess? It's a... Wow, I can hear myself. That was weird. Um, it's just a different way to put it. I like putting it into a simple, simple words. Does that make sense mm -hmm. for the peons like me? Mm -hmm. It's like, though, I just pay taxes. Right. You normie. do what you want to do. Yeah, normie. Friggin' normie. But what about like, okay, so in Star Trek, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Is that like the counter to that, where we pay taxes to take care of everyone and? Yeah, um, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, so, A, if you want to get that clip, you can go to wearelibertarians.com slash libertarianism, and then it's on Big Idea 1. You can grab that there. But we have a kind of a basic walkthrough of libertarianism at, at that at wearelibertarians.com. Look for new to libertarianism in the top bar. Sorry, I had to plug, Jess. You're in radio. You understand. Uh, but the I don't think that the intention a lot of times, is let's design a government that centrally plans to solve the needs of the many. What you, what you get is a, a small group of people trying to maintain power. You could look at the founding of America, and you can look at it two ways, uh, and both of which are not inaccurate. First way is that the, the American founding was an enormous leap in human history where a group of men decided to decentralize power, spread it out amongst the states, uh, and diffuse the power, allow Alabama to have the most restrictions on abortion, while New York allows you to have the least restrictions on abortion. And the two can both cooperate peacefully. Um, you, you can look at it as a massive step forward in human history where they said, there's no longer going to be a king. Every man is the king of themselves. Or you could look at it as a group of white slave owners, which is not totally, a, a, go talk to John Adams about slavery, a, a group of the, essentially the lords of America, as you saw in the Game of Thrones scene, where Tyrion's convincing them to, to select Bran, making sure that their personal economic interests are secured. Both of those are true. Uh, they set up in 1797 95 uh the, the when the constitution was was ratified they they recreated the articles into the constitution and built a system that was freer than any other government in human history um but at the same time did it in a way that protected themselves and their interests just like the the lords of the seven kingdoms um six six it's gray just like reality. And so, right. Not and, so black and white. And then over time, you you get w to a point 200 and nearly 50 years later where we're at now where you have a more centralized government. You have people along the ways, people like, there's something called the social gospel that was very popular after the Civil War. There was a, 
a very real problem after the Civil War I- into the early 1900s, which is part of why prohibition was was supported. I mean, if you think about it, you know you know how hard it is to pass an amendment to the Constitution. They were able to amend the Constitution to pass prohibition, which means there had to be massive support in the states and in the United States to pass a, a, a prohibition on alcohol. It wasn't just the stroke of a pen like executive power now. I mean, it was a constitutional amendment. But it had the backing because during the Civil War, you had men for the first time traveling outside of their local areas. They they were drinking a lot. They, they were carousing a lot. And then they came home, and the carousing never stopped. The drinking never stopped. The abuse of their wives from the PT, PTSD and other reasons never stopped. And so you had societies that were kind of out of control. And so the idea of the social gospel popped up, and it, and it was the idea that individual salvation isn't as important as purifying the nation and saving the soul of a nation. And so we must prohibit dancing. And uh, st- they literally used to monitor everyone's postal mail. Like Anthony Comstock uh, got put in charge of the mail, and, and like you, you couldn't get certain magazines delivered because the United States Postal Service would no longer deliver that mail. Uh, you had prohibition come out of that. You had a lot of ideas, uh, this idea that the federal government now should be in charge of being the moral arbiter of what is good and what is not in the United States. That's completely counter to the founding, but came out of very noble intentions. Right. We want less men to beat their wives. We l- want less men to be drunks. We want more productive men to to be part of society. What's the best way to do it? Let's pass a law at the federal level. And then that thinking, you know, in the Republican Party through T.R. Roosevelt and through the Democratic Party with Woodrow Wilson introduces these strains that eventually lead us to the modern parties that we have now where everybody's arguing over... Like, there are people right now protesting abortion in Indiana over Alabama laws. You don't have dick to do in Indiana with what goes on in Alabama. Like, it's you're stupid. You're just kind of, like, y- you don't understand how the actual republic works. You're just mad because you want your rights to be protected. So if if you're mad in Indiana about something that's going on in Alabama when a politician at the federal level comes along and says... I'm going to make sure that Alabama's laws don't happen. You're going to vote for that person. And they're they're trying to gain their political power by saying I will get the federal government to do stuff. And and as a non-political person, what race do you pay attention to? Maybe president? Yeah. Even that gets kind of depressing. Governor? Right. Mayor? That's about it. Right. Sorry, Andy everybody else. Andy Vibber. We're not judging you because the most of the people that listen don't even vote. But yeah, like most people, people like Pete Buttigieg or Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump want to run for president because it gives them the biggest, the biggest chunk of power they possibly can have. But we never stop to really kind of ask ourselves: Is any of this power theirs to have in the first place? Um, which I thought was kind of a, a good question. The the last questions from this thing was, uh, does a Game of Thrones say anything about... Now, n- before I ask this question, did I even come close to answering kind of your question? <laughs> yeah, sure. What was your question? I forgot now. Yeah, right. Uh, basically, <laughs> it's like, I if, if I make more money, I don't know, what are your thoughts on what he said? I think I said a lot. Um, I feel like I should... Start asking you like what I asked my teacher in school. That was a very powerful clip. That when I heard it, I went, "Oh, I'd been a libertarian since Todd hired me in 2008. I'd been a libertarian since 2007. I heard that in 2013, and I went, "Oh, I never thought of power in terms of morality. I never thought of the United States government or my local government in terms of is their power moral or legitimate." And and would I conduct my personal behavior in that way? No, I I wouldn't steal from you. It's against my personal morality. So why is it okay that I elect other people and outsource that ability to steal to someone else? So it was a very instructive clip for me, to be honest. But I think it's so far removed from how people like yourself, Jessica, think about government. You just kind of think like, 
oh, I have these two choices. Who should I choose? But you never kind of get to the place where you go, should I choose? Do I have to? Like, why do they have the ability? Why Why are there only two choices? We, we never kind of step out of that binary choice and kind of start examining it from a larger perspective. If you've lived in Australia, you have to choose. <laughs> right. Oh. Yeah, that mandatory voting. We're just like the lords that laugh at democracy when it was really the best choice. Right. Was it? Because Har- H- Hans Hermann Hoppe saw that clip and he went, I agree, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. Well, I know you wanted to get something else, but uh, I'm, I'm going to interject here. W- one of the things that I, s- as I watched, um, you know, the scene with Daenerys in, in the final season, I, it reminded me of, or I guess I drew a parallel in history of, y- you've made as, as smart people, you've made this decision of, I'm going to support this person. I think this is the best person. And then once it becomes apparent that you've elevated this person, this person has a ton of power, oh, how do we change our minds? How do we get rid of her? I kind of thought, like, this is probably how Stalin got to power. Yeah. We, we decided that Stalin was the right guy. This is the person that can change things in the right direction. Then he actually gets into power, and you're like, uh-oh, what have we done? And uh, what are our options now? Gosh, we don't really have any options it, it, it's also the incentives that are set up in the system too like you you have a system like a monarchy like the game of thrones there's no other place but there's no like john snow would have been corrupted by that system like um i heard glenn beck talk about one time when uh, bush was president this is how long ago this was uh, as uh, obama had been in office like maybe a year and Obama had just made some decision that was very Bush-like in terms of foreign policy. And he told a story about how he was visiting Bush in the Oval Office one day, the TV was on, and Obama was giving an anti-war speech, and Bush just kind of like stopped, looked at, looked at the TV, and then looked at Beck, and he goes, he's going to totally change his mind when he gets in this office. He goes, when you sit in this seat, everything changes. When you're out there on the stump speech, everything's different than when you actually sit in the seat. And so when you see somebody who is diametrically opposed to George W. Bush coming into office and continuing his policies, and then Trump diametrically opposed to Obama getting into office and continuing Bush and Obama's policies, like you see the wheel continuing on the federal level, you have to go. You couldn't pick three more different men than Bush, Obama, and Trump, and yet... There's a continuation of the government. Maybe the system itself is set up, and it doesn't matter who we put in the seat. It's the choices that have been made for them over the last 250 years or 50 years. You look at Trump, and Trump's trying not to do certain things, and and his advisors just hide the pieces of paper from him, or they don't follow through on his orders, or you know, um, you know, Trump Trump seems fairly non-interventionist compared to Bush and Obama. And yet here we are talking about Iran and going to war with Iran. And, and, and it's the same people that are in, in the swamp that he's kind of surrounded himself heading into his second term, which I think he'll probably be reelected. And you just sort of go, how did all the Bush people get back in charge? Trump is the farthest thing from a Bush person. And yet all of Bush's advisors are in charge. You know, it's not like he has better ideas because like Denarius, what do you do when the wheel's broken? What do you do when you get to the White House? I need to staff thousands of offices. And so what does Trump do? He goes to Republican think tanks in Washington, D.C., and hires the same people that went to work for those think tanks when they left the Bush administration. And so the millions of choices a day that are made in the alphabet soup of the EPA, the FCC, the FDA, are made by, bu- uh, are made by people who have sort of a governing philosophy that just is a continuation of the wheel. And those, those positions attract a certain type of person. I don't right. really want to run other people's lives. So if you ask me, hey, would you do this? I'm like, uh, uh, I'll do it for one term maybe because you're my friend. But mm-hmm. then if somebody else comes in and asks, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. But the people that, you know, John Bolton and, and uh, the career bureaucrats, like they want to make those decisions. They want to interfere in other people's lives because they know – they know better, Chris. Well, but a lot of and like I I have been spending a lot of time at the local establishment lately. And you know, with the swamp, we talk to people, 
you know, I talked to Rob Cortell in our series from the Swamp or the Swamp Explained, and, and you don't get, you you find that those people don't see it the way that we see it. They don't see themselves as wielding power, and if they do, they're wielding it for the right reasons. They're doing it for the responsible thing. We we just know better than you because we're better connected, have better information, and so we're doing what's right on your behalf. It's public service. That could be completely true. But then the other two things can be true at once. The The other truth is that I don't want you making those decisions for me. I don't need you to make those decisions for me. Quit your job and don't replace you. I don't want a new soccer stadium funded with taxpayer dollars in Indianapolis. <laughs> right. But, well, me either. But you don't understand. Yeah. It, it, the, the downtown um, core with 41,000 hospitality jobs depend on furthering the sports strategy of building – sports stadiums and if we don't build a soccer stadium then we give up on that strategy that gave us a vibrant downtown that's the envy of the world todd and there's some truth to that there's absolutely truth to the fact that indianapolis investing city when dollars the, when the Pacers were playing in market square when i was growing up you did not want to be in downtown after night absolutely and there is a lot of truth to the fact that using taxpayer money to build these sports arenas downtown and build a mall downtown led to Indianapolis having a downtown that is much different than Philadelphia, Columbus, Atlanta. Cincinnati, Atlanta. It, it is a great downtown. Um, but the choice now, if you were mayor, the choice was made for you in 1969 when Luger was mayor or 1972 when Hudnut was mayor. You now continue that policy or you don't because you now have 41,000 people that are dependent on that environment. Question, because I can talk soccer a little bit, not right. politics. How come they want their own stadium, like a, their own soccer stadium, right? Because in Atlanta, mm -hmm. they just got a major league soccer team, the Atlanta United, and they are sharing the Mercedes-Benz, you know, stadium yeah. with the Falcons, and it works out pretty well because, whatever. Yeah, actually, we can't I have just a, do that. I have a good friend that got season tickets to the uh, soccer. I've been to team, a couple games. And They're he fantastic. really liked it. Yeah. So I think that the people on the ground floor of MLS. They didn't have to have a soccer specific stadium, but what MLS has said is from now on, oh. anyone who gets an expansion franchise like Cincinnati is building a new one, for example, has to have a dedicated soccer only stadium to be approved into See, MLS. I'm not informed. Thank you. No, that's why you're here. You're that's here why to be, I'm here. I'm the. You're what the, is it? What the, am I? The the voice the of normie? the listener. Normie. Yes. The normie. The normie. You're, you're here to be the voice of the listener. I'm for a, this muggle. <laughs> a muggle. A <Yeah>. muggle. <laughs> because what, what you have to understand, Jess, and, and then I want to do more of this on episodes, is that there are more of our listeners like you trying to figure stuff out. And so if you're here going, I have a question, that's better for our audience than having a bunch of like people like me going, just talking over everyone's head. I mean, I know Ron Paul. Nobody else you've right. mentioned. Sorry. So the, 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 the real answer, that's, he gave the answer that they tell you publicly. He gave you the answer that you read in the Indianapolis Business Journal. Hmm. Here's the answer. Indeed. They're playing in Lucas Oil Stadium. That's a great stadium. Mm -hmm. A lot of taxpayer money built that stadium. Uh, but the guy who owns the soccer team is a real estate developer. And if he can convince IPS to sell the old Broad Ripple High School in one of the most vibrant areas of downtown, it's called Broad Ripple. It's a college area. That land is so valuable. He can then build condos, a soccer stadium, retail shops, and he now owns the land rights to one of the most valuable pieces of property in all of Indianapolis. And so, like Jim Irsay, became a billionaire with the stroke of the pen when Mitch Daniels and, and the city of Indianapolis signed the deal for Lucas Oil Stadium, the Colts owner became a billionaire that day with that stroke of the pen because he was backed by the taxpayers of Indiana. But where are my tickets? Doesn't You don't matter. I didn't like, get Colts tickets, though. Right. And here's the difference, is that people are willing to make a risk on the Colts because Joe Sixpack, it's aspirational. I may one day get to go to Lucas Oil Stadium, so I don't mind if my tax dollars go to it because I want to go to a Colts game and I don't want them to leave. But I don't want to watch no gosh darn soccer. Thank you. But... <laughs> He That's still he still got the funding to build a soccer stadium, and it's because Ursal also is a major donor to a lot of Indiana politicians, and lives in the neighborhood, 
votes next to all of these politicians. What? Yeah. Why so, is Why is Braun on the small council? Yeah, and that's he right. We got his back just like that. Right. We got to get back to Game of Thrones. He's just like the soccer guy. He's like nobody wants you here, but you're here anyway. Right. <laughs> one, of, one other thing on my list before we leave corruption entirely that that really spoke to me was and both in the books and the Stannis Baratheon is portrayed as an honorable man. He is completely corrupted by power to the point where he lets someone kills his own daughter. Is that the guy who at the end stood up to try and make the argument that he was the king? Or is this the no, guy? That's, her, that's no. Sansa's uncle that yeah. married the Walter Frey that daughter. Was the, his, it was his red wedding, technically. Oh, uh, okay. He's the guy that got married at the red wedding. Okay, I remember who that is. No, you're talking about the guy who was dating... Who's the red woman. Dating the red woman. Yes, right. yeah. Yeah. yes. And, and you know, let, let her... Turn him into a shade with for black power. magic for power, to kill, for power and to kill his other brother to kill to kill his other brother for power and yeah eventually to sacrifice his own his own uh, daughter yeah I think that's a really good point I think that one of the major themes for it for me with political corruption is that political power dehumanizes you mm-hmm. I mean when you get to a certain point you 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 were talking about how like locally maybe so they start like you know I'm doing this for good I'm doing this to help right. people but eventually it doesn't you lose that and and that's what happened to like all of your favorite characters in the show is that they all got corrupted by that power and they lost their humanity and mm-hmm. and Daenerys even talking to John in that final episode didn't see what she did she still couldn't see Zero it, awareness. even with him like begging her in her, in her face. She still couldn't see what she did, and it was like she had lost all of her huma- her humanity to me. Yeah, and that's what happened with Stannis. That's why I remembered that is because Stannis did the same exact thing happen to him. That was almost parallel. Yeah, they become so convinced that what they're doing is right that they lose sight that they're hurting people. Like the people who designed CPS thought that they were helping children, but the end result is that CPS just. It, it makes people think that they did something yeah. by calling CPS, and children never get helped. Oh, I'm a doctor. I just called CPS. Well, they don't do anything. They don't protect kids. Uh, anybody who's ever watched CPS and how they operate, uh, you have. I have so many female friends who they get investigated because their ex has been called. The CPS has been called on their ex. They get them out to the house, but the ex has a lawyer, and so they don't go investigate him. And so the behavior from the the man continues while the woman and her children suffer because the doctors and the teachers and everybody called CPS. We felt like we did something, you know, and that's mm-hmm. that's the end result of it. And so innocent people just get hurt all of the time. So man. Um, it's kind of depressing. I know. Uh, <laughs> welcome to We Are Libertarians. Um, so. Are there any forms of power that the powerless have? Think about Arya, Sansa, Bran, and Rickon. Or children have less obvious power in this book, but do they hold any power over others? I mean, what power do the seemingly powerless in our society or in the story, what sort of threads of power do you see them having? I mean, in, in my mind, the trauma that the Stark girls go through, for instance, ends up making them have nerves of steel they be you look at their mother and you go wow how did she become that way well she became that way because she went through the same thing sansa did you know she and so we we tend to look at older people and go how they get that strength it's like because they were weak and went through shit at one point and to me that is one example of how people gain power is they rise above those circumstances and work through situations where they felt powerless so she was in an accident in outer space and then she like got reborn right no, no. is that is that not how caitlin start what <laughs> did i say her name wrong no no no. you're fine okay Sorry. all right um real nerds will get the reference all right good <laughs> you laughed did you yeah all right so any any other thoughts about the powerless in this particular story or in our own society what what powers do they might possibly wield? I mean, persuasion, right? I mean, kids kids are cute because when they're acting like assholes, you don't strangle them. Okay? <laughs> I, have, I have two kids of my own. So, you know, for example, Ned Stark, the only reason that he agrees to, uh, you know, confess to treason is to save his daughter's lives. So his, his daughters in that way have a power over their father. What about the little birds, the kids that are working for like Varys, the Master of Whispers? Yeah. Like they're learning from him because as a kid you're unsuspected. Right. 
but you can uh, kind of gain power that way, work your way up the ranks eventually. Uh, seduction is another form of power. The way that seduction came about over, over time is that physically women couldn't compete with men in prehistory and then, you know, in, in, until recent history, really. And so seduction was the power that women w- wielded to further their own interests. And that's, that's one way, that's one particular power. That'd be that, Marjorie. Right. In this case, probably. Yeah. Magic. Magic. Supernatural power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not in reality, but in the show, there well, there is that power. I believe Children in of the forest. <laughs> I believe yeah. in God. They're not so. strong, but they have magic. Um, Bran, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, there are some specific examples that are called out in the show. Mm-hmm. I, I would say that one power that isn't often seen as maybe social custom or social norms or even the law is a power that helps protect the innocent. Um, you see in the case, uh, like Mercy, for instance, uh, maybe there's some examples in Game of Thrones of Mercy where it was shown and that, you know, m- maybe somebody was about Tyrion. When Tyrion is uh, is alleged to have poisoned uh, Joffrey and Mercy is shown to him, that's that's one example of power that people can have over yeah. the innocent. We were but talking we about individual power. I was just thinking of the church, you know, institutional power. Yeah. Like how the, the high sparrow rose from, you know, barefoot in the streets to... right. Having the queen and and two queens locked up in a dungeon, basically. They mm-hmm. had like the most power mm-hmm. until Cersei basically blasted them. Yeah. And the opposite of that is money, right? The mm-hmm. Lannisters have power because there's gold under Casterly Rock. So, yep. So, I, I guess we could say n- that we started out with the immorality of political power in in a lot of ways, but there are forms of power that are moral, things like justice, things like mercy, that are are wielded in. Uh, our, our moral powers. Um, it, yeah, it kind of gets John killed, John Snow killed, right? Because he right. wants to go against custom, invite the wildlings and the giants in, and no, you can't just kill the giant. He's eating vegetables and, and such. And the Night Watch, basically, the mutineers say, that isn't right. For the Night's Watch, we're going to kill you. Hey, Todd, do you remember for seven seasons we heard winter is coming, winter is coming, and then we got to stock food. We got to, and then winter came, and then nothing happened with winter. They killed it. They ended Win- long night. But yeah. winter it still, still happened. It still did come no. trickle down because it started it, snowing in King's Landing. Yeah, right. that, that was nuclear winter, though. Yeah, that's but just in the, in the <laughs> yeah. books. In the books, he does infer that maybe when the long night ends, that the seasons might become a little more regular mm. instead of year, like you know. Who doesn't and need years to be? Long. Didn't you see the grass? North of the wall when they're getting into the haunted yeah, forest. Yeah, like north the, of the wall. What is it? The <laughs> dreams of spring yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. I did not. All right, uh, let's give our final thoughts on 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 the show on all of this. Uh, just to, let's go around. Uh, Galt, you you're an old veteran. Why uh, don't you show the young kids how it's done? Well, I I mean I kind of went into mine. It's all about. I think it's always all about dehumanization. And um, one other point I'll make about it, like with Stannis that did it, and then you know. Um, you also had the opposite happen with Cersei. Um, she had all that political power, and she wasn't a human for seasons. For you know, many seasons, we didn't see any emotion from her. And she and, was her father. I and mean, at the f- end, when she lost her political power, she became human again, and she cared about her baby and and her brother. And and you almost wanted you didn't want to, but you almost felt something for her there. Mm-hmm. And and that was that was you know. I think it was pretty clear there that once she lost that power, she brought, got her humanity back. Yeah. All right, Jess so. Alzman, final thoughts on Game of Thrones or power or anything that you like to say? Overall, great series. I think the characters are very just detailed, and there's, there's more to them than just on the surface, which is really cool to see the character arcs and how they develop and how they handle situations like either getting power or having to you know find their own strength, whether it be Sansa or Arya or, I don't know, John, bless his heart in the end. <laughs> still want to see him on the throne but whatever he can go be wild north of the wall i guess so i don't know it's really cool and i like how i'm on here and you guys are kind of putting real world stuff into it i Trying. appreciate yeah. that not just me comparing game of thrones to lord of the rings it's so a new thank way to you think guys about it, isn't yeah it? did you did you learn anything this episode i did what did you learn uh, what do you think, Todd? Of Game of Thrones? Like of that. This i'm gonna start episode. doing that <laughs> Just I, w- <laughs> I want to reiterate something that uh, Jess said, that I really enjoyed the series. I really enjoyed the 
first three books. But, you know, so while <laughs> I have some nitpicks, this was great entertainment, great yeah. television, great acting. Um, so even though I said, you know, some things, that, some nitpicks, I, I really uh, thank HBO for putting all the money into it and all the entertainment. Uh, so final words here. I'm going to just mention this. Ro Robbie Suave from Reason, he wrote uh, several things on Game of Thrones Game of Thrones this season, and uh, he talked about in a podcast uh, recently, both John and Tyrion rebuke this madness, uh, uh, Daenerys is who he's referring to, it's hard not to recognize a kind of libertarian principle in their condemnation. Uh, on the podcast, I referenced C.S. Lewis's famous quote about tyrants, and it's fitting here to reproduce the entire thing. Quote, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It would be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. The mm. robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. Mm. They may be more likely to go to heaven, yet at the same time likelier to make a hell of earth. And that's why John wow. had to kill Daenerys. Yeah. That's yeah, really good. Malice mentioned that quote. I, I would recommend Michael Malice's book, The New Right. Uh, wow. If you've th found this episode interesting, you'll find that book uh, interesting as well. Um, uh, were you done, by the way? I wanted to make sure that you got everything out. Okay. All right. Jessica's done. I don't want to cut you off, Spangle. No, that's okay. Cut him off. No. Cut. That's what makes it great. Cut him off. When someone cut has, off. you know... Some kahunas to stand up to the dear leader. Well, she she made a joke oh, about yeah. Todd, but I just want to make Get sure. Get ready for her. 20 questions tomorrow in the office. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you dare put those headphones on. I'm like, so Spangle, tell me your thoughts on this with history. Uh -huh. And when did this happen? I will and just, then I will just why look did they you. do this? I go, can we just do a follow-up episode? Uh, just got a text. Um, th those of you who listen religiously, uh, like, Todd, you know, you texted me and said, I heard Miranda was going to be on this episode. And uh, <laughs> so if you want some backup in case she doesn't show up, uh, then then I'll be there. And I said, come on down. Uh, I knew Galt was going to show up. He's he's Mr. Reliable. I asked Jess on. And then uh, Miranda just texted me at 918 p.m. when we started at seven. Oh, my God. I just realized today was Tuesday. LOL. Did you GOT podcast without me? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Miranda's we art. are finishing it as we speak. LOL. <laughs> no worries. I should have reminded her. Uh, but uh, she's follow up episode on Game of Thrones. <laughs> that we're doing? Yes. yes. <laughs> One more hour. Um, all right, guys. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. I, I would say my wrap up is that I loved the series as a whole. I thought, as you can see from this episode, it was very illustrative of a lot of things that we see in our own lives that can help us kind of elevate from the story and, and kind of examine things from a different perspective and, and look at political power from a different way. It kind of helps maybe marry it to, to sort of what we see today. Um, I think for us individually, when it talks, uh, w when we talk about what we can do, it really comes down to your individual choices. And, and what you see in Game of Thrones are a lot of individuals making a lot of choices. They have sometimes a binary choice between good and evil, or there's even in our own lives, those moments of gray where I could lie and tell this little white lie and nobody's going to know the difference, but you start spinning out of control with that or um, not all of us are Ned Stark and just full of honor all the time and always do the right thing and not all of us are Daenerys Targaryen uh, lighting everyone and, and committing genocide. Um, you know, a lot of us are uh, the Cle Clegane brothers, you know, the Hound who who do good and bad things. And at very, uh, I think he is, for me, the most human in the story because the Hound wants to just do whatever he wants to do and then gets sucked along by duty and gets sucked along by doing the right thing, but then sometimes in doing the right thing, is it's necessary to do the bad thing. Um, and I think he just is kind of... He, he sh exemplified the push and pull that we constantly see in our daily lives and by his constantly making the right choice, meaning the good choice, we have that power too. And he became a very powerful person in the story. And so I think you have to think about what choices you make on a daily basis and how uh, you 
uh, interact with others and how you vote and how you express your values and, and what you think. Uh, and that really is your power. Your power is to make those individual choices. And the millions, the billions of people that live on this planet, the more we can convince and persuade to make the right choices and to enact your morality through your vote and, and stop uh, s- stop just because um, you want to use the barrel of a gun and, and vote in a certain type of morality or a certain type of policy, it doesn't make your cho- choice more moral. So... So just remember your own power and remember uh, that it comes in the form of daily choices. So that's what I would say. Yes, Jess. Can I make one more normie comment? Please. I would like to see in politics, and this is really hard because it'll never happen, right? Mm-hmm. Find a leader that puts his interest, his or her interest aside like Tormund did and Jon Snow. So Tormund with the Wildlings and Jon yep. Snow with the Night's Watch. Everything you've ever heard or ever thought, let's put that all aside, the, big woman. the best it's interest totally. is to fight the dead that are coming right. south. And, you know, you had some of the wildlings ticked off about it. And guess what? Most of them died because, oh, snap, they didn't get on the boats. And then you had uh, the other people, the brothers wa- brothers of the Night's Watch. They end up killing Jon Snow, basically. Yeah. So Surprisingly, Tolman was one of the most moral characters. Yeah. yeah like yeah. Even when he was rejected by Brienne, he just said, eh. He was the most real. I'll realist. go north, you know. He, like, I'm not going to... You know, fight him over her or nothing, you know. I like wish she I made had, her choice. I wish I had <laughs> saved the meme because it was like, we all want to laugh at Tormund, but when he got declined, he just shrugged his shoulders and went off and didn't didn't call the girl a slut. And I was like, yeah. the, the girl was like, <laughs> be like Tormund. But I, I would say to your point, Jess, uh, we don't need to find a leader. I think what you see in guys like Tormund or even Jon Snow, like they they circumstances force them into leadership because they made the right choices. And I think if we can make the right choices, we become the leaders. Like We don't have to find somebody. We don't have to delegate that or outsource that power to somebody else. We have the ability to step up and be those leaders. Whoa, that's deep. Thank you. The power is within me the whole time. Exactly. And you didn't even know it. So... With great power comes great responsibility. Oh, man, don't you put that on me, Spidey. Spidey's <laughs> uncle. <sighs> so, uh, you know, I <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't thank our patrons. I apologize that I did it so late in the episode. I just started geeking out. Uh, you going to the 500? Of again? course I'm awesome. going to the Indy 500. I'll, uh, I can't wait to see you and the rest of the, the wall crew in the infield. I'm going to come visit you guys again. Awesome. I, uh, I work... Uh, we we have media passes, so oh cool. Are you going out to the five hundred too? One day you'll have there. to get wall media passes because I would love. Is there a wall that. tent? Am I invited to that? I swear, if Jeremiah get a wall media pass, if, if Jeremiah uh, if Jeremiah doesn't quit <laughs> asking <of> me, <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah Morrill asks me weekly, uh, all year long, every oh. week, fifty two <laughs> times a year. Well, you should do it and then give it to me instead of him. I go. Oh. They're oh. not going <laughs> to give a libertarian <laughs> podcast <laughs> media passes. They out to will the if you sponsor a car. Bet. Okay, well, our Patreon's doing well, <laughs> but not that well. If you'd like to support, throw $5 million our way. <laughs> right. I don't have an IndyCar sponsorship. Extra 150 k laying around. And uh. If I did, I probably wouldn't go to an IndyCar. Uh, but thank you to those uh, who make that dream of a sponsorship, uh, getting us closer and closer. Craig DaCosta, Christy Avery, uh, the Libertarian Coalition, Jason Doolittle, and Ed Brehob, uh, and Memerty Libs. Thank you guys so much, and uh, we appreciate all of your patronage and uh, for supporting us. And we're we have a team meeting tomorrow night at seven thirty. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, new things that we've got going on. So there's a new. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a, another Thrones episode next week. Oh, what is yeah. it? The it's last like a watch. Yeah, it's like a documentary of the show. Oh, the oh creation cool. Of it, so big fans will still watch. Same time, nine o'clock. You know. All right. All right, thanks for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. Thank you to Todd. Thank you to Jessica. Thank you to uh, Chris Galt. And uh, thank you to you for listening. So thank we you, Chris it. Spangle. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you to me because I don't get thanked a lot. You never do. Thanks, no. Spangle. I need more thanks in my life. Thank you. Sorry, Jessica. thanks, dear leader. Thank you. All right, <laughs> we'll see you later. Thanks, and we'll.